When first elected a little over two years ago, the world swooned over Justin Trudeau, a fresh young face on the world stage. The prime minister here at home was seen as a sharp departure in style and substance after almost a decade of Stephen Harper. Since then, both of the major opposition parties have chosen new, younger leaders, and Trudeau's flair has been put to the test of governing. Now that we're past the midway point of his majority term, we're asking, does Canada have the leaders it needs in an increasingly chaotic world? To consider that, we welcome, in the nation's capital, Susan Riley, freelance political columnist. In St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, Alex Marlin, professor of political science at Memorial University and the author of Brand Command, Canadian Politics and Democracy in the Age of Message Control. And with us here in the studio, Andrew Coyne, columnist with the National Post. And Andrew, it's good to see you again back in that chair to our friends out of town. We're glad you could join us as well. Let's just note, as we start here, the Angus Reid Organization, uh, which constantly monitors these things, has been checking the Prime Minister's approval rating. And he's off about 10 points uh, over the past year. 46% now approving of him, 49% disapproving. So underwater, as they say, by three points. I wonder, Susan, let's go to you first. What's been going on over the last year or so that, in your judgment, uh, would have adversely affected his popularity rankings? Uh, well, time, first of all, inflicts all sorts of wounds on any political leader. That's inevitable. But I think in this case, he's particularly been hurt by uh, the allegation, the, the, the narrative that he's a rich guy who lives a life on, that very few Canadians can afford and that he's basically privileged and he's kind of a hypocrite when it comes um, what, you know, when it comes to his talk about the middle class, that's one. And number two, I think, uh, I do think his um, backing away from the promise on electoral reform is, ha is doing lasting damage. Hmm. Follow up on that if you would, eh? because that's, that's one of those issues that a lot of people think, oh, only the pointy heads care about that, not the average Canadian. Well, the pointy heads vote. Uh, they a lot of them would have voted liberal, I would imagine. Um, and I think, uh, and and beyond people who care passionately about this subject, and as you know, people who do care do care passionately. Uh, there are other Canadians who observed that this was a very unambiguous promise, and he broke it with a very feeble uh, rationale. So I think it hurt him. Alex, what would you add to that list? I would agree more with the first point than the second. I'm not saying the second point isn't a good one. Of course it is. And I, I do agree with the point that it's really among pointy heads and people who really pay a lot of attention to politics who care about that. Um, the way I often think about politics is I'm reminded of what a conservative political marketer once told me, which is by the time that um, people in politics are sick of hearing about something is roughly around the time that uh, other people who don't pay attention to politics are starting to hear about it for the first time. And so for me, when I think about what's uh, some, uh, plaguing uh, Justin Trudeau and his administration, I think a lot about the ethics issues. I think particularly there's a, a photograph of him with the Aga Khan that keeps appearing over and over. The idea of uh, the prime minister being on a, on a private helicopter going to a private island, it, it's just something that will not sit very well with many Canadians. Now, having said that, you come to us today from Newfoundland and Labrador, where if the numbers are accurate, the Prime Minister has a 61% approval rating, only 38% disapproval. What do you think accounts for the fact that people on the rock seem to like this guy a whole lot? Yeah, and I should note that uh, Judy Foote, uh, who had been Minister with Justin Trudeau, had resigned. Uh, there was a by-election recently, and I'm, I'm pretty convinced, I mean, with all respect to the MP who ended up being elected, uh, you could have run a dead cat in that riding and, and it would have gone Liberal with a very high percentage of the vote. Uh, there's no question that the Liberal Party is very popular in Newfoundland and Labrador. Indeed, it's quite popular throughout the Atlantic provinces. Um, for me, I think a lot of the issue is that um, aside from policy, when you look at some of the, some of the broader um, elements that connect people with Justin Trudeau, um, I often use the following example, and that is that during the election campaign, there were all sorts of people that I interact with who don't normally pay attention to politics, who really fawn over Justin Trudeau, just, oh, isn't he wonderful, isn't he good looking, isn't he dynamic, and all these sorts of things. And those same people over time since then have been saying to me, oh, what's this about legalizing marijuana? Where did that come from? And so it, it helps me think about how a lot of people, and there's lots of research to back this up, not just in Canada, but in the United States, that says that when people make vote decisions and have impressions of leaders, it's often based on limited information. So I would suggest that 
Um, you know, the, the ethics controversy and other things uh, is taking a toll, but there's no question that a lot of people in this province uh, like the Liberal Party, and that's even um, when we have a very uh, difficult situation here in the province with the provincial Liberals. Andrew, let me get you to weigh in. Well, I mean, the, the, on the electoral reform thing, first of all, there's a reason why they put it in the platform. And it wasn't just to appeal to point ahead intellectuals. It was to signal. It was a signal to NDP voters that we're not to, the typical liberals. We actually care about your issues. It was a symbol of ide idealism and of, of not politics as usual. And, of course, Justin Trudeau's persona itself also was supposed to convey that. Uh, so that was the positives, and, and, and a lot of the reasons why people kind of atmospherically leaned towards liberals was they were so tired of the cynicism and the, the nastiness of the, of the Harper era that this was going to be a, a clean break from that. I think one of the things that has hurt him over the last year or so has been this accumulating impression of cynicism, of, of actually is kind of a calculating politician like all the others, which was obvious from the start, but perhaps low information voters would take a while to figure that out. Um, I think also the... the, the uh, the rich kid thing, particularly in the context of the tax changes that they brought out. Uh, the tax changes are, you know, you can argue them back and forth, but the particular thing of we're going to go after people for, who have private corporations to reduce their tax burden, which, first of all, we found that, uh, that Bill Morneau had the same issues with. Finance minister. And, of course, so does Justin Trudeau. Mm -hmm. And the hypocrisy of that... The Lord knows how the Liberals couldn't have seen that coming, but I think it's been very damaging for them because that middle class message, that mantra that they go on, was not just meant as a sword, it was meant as a shield. It was meant to protect him against this impression of he's just the son of all the negative things of being the son of Pierre Trudeau, the entitlement, the, the riches, etc. If that gets pierced, then I think there's some trouble. The final point I'll make is these numbers on the approval rating are interesting. What I'd really love to see are the, are the more deep uh, number of questions that pollsters ask about character. Does he care about people like me? Is he trustworthy? Those kinds of questions. And if, if I would suspect there's been some greater damage done there. Well, while you turn your phone off, because I think I hear something ringing in your pocket, uh, <laughs> come on in, Ottawa. I think I hear you trying to get in, Susan. Uh, yeah, I, I mean... I think the, uh, the the small business tax changes hurt him with a certain constituency, a certain constituency that's relatively small but has a really large megaphone, and um, it, it did him some damage. And it reminds me, as Andrew was speaking, that um, no good deed goes unpunished. Um, every time the Prime Minister gets a chance, he boasts about the things that his government has done, some of them very good, including the child tax benefit, for example, which is, as he keeps saying, lifted 300,000 children out of poverty. Um, they have solidified uh, the CPP the Canadian Pension Plan, which, which uh, will be reassuring to a lot of seniors. And they've done various and sundry other more symbolic gestures that will please Liberals and Canadians generally. Um, that being said, I remember, and Andrew probably remembers this too, Paul Martin boasting about bringing in the largest income tax cut in Canadian history. I, I don't think anybody really noticed People it. didn't I notice. Don't think that it was the a, criticism, yes. Yeah, and I don't think I don't think it had a big impact on what happened uh, to Paul Martin. But that's just a little sidebar on how um, how difficult politics can be. Well, Andrew, follow up on this because uh, I mean, here's the word of the day now: perspective. Yes, his numbers are lower than they were when he got elected in a you know a wave of uh, euphoria uh, two years ago. Euphoria certainly among those who who supported him. But the number today on is it time for a change in government is 46 percent. That means 54 percent are content. Any prime minister will take that number, right? Fair to say? Yeah, but if, as long as we're talking about perspective, this is with the lowest unemployment rate in 40 years. Um, usually we think of the economy as being the kind of thing that dictates the fortunes of governments. Usually when times are good economically, uh, people are in relatively good odor about the, the government of the day. So it's unusual that they should be back basically to 37, 38% in the polls as a party uh, when the economy is doing so well. Shachi Curl is going to join yeah. us now. She is the executive director of the Angus Reid Institute. She joins us on the line from Vancouver, British Columbia. Shachi, it's good to have you joining our discussion here. We've um, just been trying to figure out uh, why the Prime Minister's numbers appear to be into somewhat of a reversal of fortune from a little over two years ago when he first got elected. You've been crunching numbers at Angus Reid. What have you come up with? So he's spending down capital, Steve. This is a big part of it. I think it's important also to kind of rack back that time when he was election elected. You talked about a wave of euphoria. In fact, what we see is that 
in the early stages uh, after the election, after October of 2015, his approval numbers actually increased. They went up. They didn't go down. They didn't stay stable. So he banked some political capital uh, and he's been spending it down. You saw some uh, slippage and some spending of that political capital uh, after the approval, for example, in British Columbia of the twinning of the Kinder Morgan pipeline. You saw a little bit more political capital spent down uh, when the government reversed itself on the decision on electoral reform. Every time there's a decision, a little bit more of the base starts to feel uh, less uh, excited about, less uh, inclined to approve of the job the prime minister's doing. To Andrew's point about trustworthiness and character, look, on these issues, what you find is that uh, it's, it's all relative, number one. Uh, they still find him trustworthy enough. Um, Character-wise, well, there are some questions now being raised around entitlement versus is he a guy uh, who's out there for me? The, the question on whether or not this government is the one out there swinging for the middle class is going to be one that Canadians continue to assess. The big issue, however, is we don't know if that's going to be the issue that voters ultimately make their decisions around come uh, 2019. Shachi, let me do a quick follow-up with you, and that is, I do recall when he was talking about his own financial circumstances, he used the expression in referring to them as, quote-unquote, my family fortune. I, I wonder how problematic the use of that expression was in trying to convey a sense that I'm on your side, middle-class Canada. Look, uh... I don't think if any voters really stop to think about it in October of 2015, um, whether they really accepted or believed that this was just a regular guy. This was a guy doing uh, campaign stops wearing very expensive watches. This is someone whose uh, wife is very always very stylishly put together, but is also wearing designer clothes, as is he. So this is not um, an issue that this particular politician uh, has has necessarily been able to make an articulate uh, argument against that, hey, I'm just a regular guy. So, of course, that sets up the contrast between Justin Trudeau and Andrew Scheer. Andrew Scheer is out there talking about how he rides the bus and how, you know, his family didn't have a car growing up and how he's the regular guy. Again, it does come down to whether or not this issue of regularity or I'm just an average Joe becomes the defining issue of the next election. We'll get to the leader of the opposition in just a few moments, but I want to do one more thing here on the prime minister. Susan Riley, here's what you wrote in the Hill Times not too long ago. Trudeau remains an opaque figure. Is he an entitled rich boy with a low tolerance for dissent and a sharp temper? or a compassionate champion of the marginalized whose empathy is genuine and efforts sincere. There is evidence, though scant, of both tendencies, but which one predominates? Since you've asked the question in the piece, I'm going to ask you to answer it now here on TV. Gee, I wish I knew. Um, I don't know. When, when I'm watching him uh, with survivals of residential schools, for example, or with any indigenous group, um, went with Gord Downey, uh, I'm moved. I think his empathy is genuine and um, it's rare in politics and he doesn't seem to be ashamed to show his emotion. Um, and I think, oh, this is a fundamentally very decent person whose heart is in the right place. On the other hand, when he pretends, and it's the pretense rather than going with the, to the Aga Khan's island, but when he claims that the Aga Khan was a close personal friend and it turns out that that's not so much the case, um, I really think, who are you and what game are you playing? So I'm, I'm on both sides at the moment. Hmm. And maybe he's both. I mean, it's quite possible that he contains multitudes, and he, he's both. He's a weird mixture in another way of occasional sort of flower child naivete and then occasional just deep cynicism. And, and again, I, the people, he contains multitudes. He's a, he's a complicated character that way. What's the most egregious example of the deep cynicism that you just referred to? Well, the, going, going back on, on electoral reform, for example, it's just, and the answers and the explanations of it are so shallow. And the flower just, child naivete? Uh, praising Fidel Castro and his death, for example, mm. without any acknowledgement of, the, of his barbaric human rights record. Let's try this, Alex. Uh, I just mentioned in that Susan Riley column that there's a reference to a low tolerance for dissent. Uh, it is interesting that actually of all the caucuses in the House of Commons, uh, there's only one where, for example, your position on abortion has to be one position and one position only, or you're not allowed in. And that is the Liberal caucus, and the issue is you got to be pro-choice. What does that, or what do you infer from that in terms of what kind of leader he is? 
Well, I guess I would answer that in two ways. Uh, going back to the, the previous comments that others were saying, I would say what really matters is perception is reality. So as outsiders, we can't really know Mr. Trudeau, uh, but it's really only what we end up perceiving that really ends up mattering to the electorate. Um, on the main question that you're asking, um, there's all sorts of uh, evidence that indicates that um, Mr. Trudeau is uh, decentralizing his office. He's extending power to other people, and so ministers have more autonomy than they would have had under uh, Mr. Harper. Um, but that power, in my view, is really flowing to some of those people who are closely around uh, Mr. Trudeau. So it's not like the power has somehow evaporated. Um, the point that I think I would make is uh, the role of the Senate here. Um, for me, uh, the ability for the Senate to potentially block some of the things that the uh, Liberal government is trying to do is quite a, a, a unique and interesting thing that um, most of us should are, are not necessarily paying attention to, but perhaps should. Well, he, in fact, initiated this. That's a brave thing. Yeah, go ahead, Susan. I was going to say, this is, this is historic reform, and he brought that in. That's right, and I think it's a brave thing and a risky thing, and it, it is blowing up on him to some, some instances. But I think, um, again, he, I, you know, it's another example of, you know, every good deed, uh, no good deed goes unpunished. I mean, I think, I think that's going to hurt him in, in the end. I think it's an example, and we've seen several of these, of the grand gesture, the great sweeping statement that you figure out the details later. So we'll kick all the liberals out of the Senate, out of the, all, all the senators out of the Liberal Caucus. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll institute this um, half thought out reform, and yeah, it comes back to bite you. And I'd have a lot more time for him being willing to share power with the Senate if it was an elected body. But sharing power with a bunch of appointees, uh, I'm not so keen on. I think but it's the, a, the, I think it's a mess. The, I mean, at the, at, I don't want to go down this road too far. <laughs> but but the I mean, these aren't sort of the typical. This guy ran my campaign in, Absolutely. you know, leftover shoe Saskatchewan, and therefore I'm putting him in the Senate. Yeah. These are different people yeah, who are getting they, appointed now. They're not partisan liberals, but as many have observed, they're people who can be counted upon to support the liberal agenda. Okay. Let's try this here. We're going to do something but from Conrad Yakubuski in the Globe and Mail. All right, Susan, go ahead. Jump in. I was just going to say, you know, this is not a dead man walking. I don't. I think we, we need to like re refocus for a minute. He's still immensely popular. He's been applauded at the challenge, just but applauded at these uh, town halls that he's been having recently. I remember just a month or so ago, uh, he was campaigning in White Rock, uh, Surrey, and there were hundreds of people standing in the pouring rain to see him. That might be curiosity. Maybe m the more Canadians that go to these uh, town halls and, and listen to his utterly banal and boring responses to most of the questions will decide, well, maybe he's not so interesting after all. Maybe that will fade. But he still got a lot of star power and a lot of, I would say, friendly interest. Well, to that point, let me read this excerpt from the Globe and Mail's Conrad Yakubuski from uh, earlier this month. Mr. Trudeau's managerial style suggests a leader somewhat disengaged from the job he was elected to perform. After Stephen Harper's frigid personality, Canadians wanted likability and empathy from their Prime Minister, and Mr. Trudeau scores highly on both. He clearly prefers the ceremonial aspects of his job to the actual exercise of power. He seems to view his job as one of brand building and selling the final product. Shachi, is that okay with you? You know, you have to look at Justin Trudeau within the context of, to Mr. Yakubuski's point, where he stood relative to Stephen Harper. Uh, Canadians did not want another Stephen Harper. They do not want a Stephen Harper. That uh, ghost continues to loom large. And the other piece of it is, of course, how is he seen and, and how does he stack up against the other opposition leaders? How does he stack up against Andrew Scheer? How does he stack up against Jagmeet Singh, who, uh, you know, appeared to come in with, with all of this momentum and all of this flair? At the end of the day, he may be south of 50 in terms of approval, but he is still higher than the other two guys. Uh, and people have made up their mind about him. They've either decided that they like him or they don't. But there isn't a lot of room for him to be defined any further than he has been defined. The questions around style over substance, gravita versus flippancy, have largely been asked and answered, and Canadians have decided where they've settled with the guy. That may go up a little bit, it may go down a little bit, but the question now becomes, what about these other two federal leaders? Okay, you've given me a nice segue to get on to the leader of the opposition, Andrew Scheer, leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. Here's what your Angus Reid Institute has come up with in terms of his approval numbers, 35% approving of his performance, 36% disapproving, 29% don't know. Now, I mean, all of those numbers when put together, Shachi, seem really quite pablum. Do I need to read anything more into it than that? 
I, the only thing I would say about those numbers and about the numbers you're going to show about Mr. Singh, I presume in a couple of moments, are this. Uh, those high levels of don't know numbers might seem quite worrying at the outset. You know, uh, in terms of uh, time spans and politics, this is 2018. In a few months, we're going to be a year out from the next campaign. And if we continue to see Andrew Scheer or Jagmeet Singh with very high uh, don't know numbers, uh, that could prompt some concern over, well, do they do they stand a chance? And the thing I would counter with is campaigns actually matter. And sometimes if you are an opposition leader, it's actually to your benefit to not be particularly known, not be particularly defined, especially by your opponents, until people are uh, in, a, in a gear and engaged and ready to be paying attention to who these people are and what their messages are. You get out there too far, too fast, too early, uh, you give your opponents an opportunity to, to to counter and define you in turn. Well, Susan, one of the things I suspect a lot of Canadians know about Andrew Scheer is that he is a proud social conservative. And my question for you is how socially conservative can a conservative party leader in Canada be and still become prime minister? I don't think he's a proud social conservative. I think he's a kind of um, hesitant, tentative social conservative. I mean, he, he understands the dangers of fully embracing uh, some of those ideas and platforms, and so he kind of has been backing away. I think he's very much handling this like uh, the way Stephen Harper did. So Stephen Harper was socially conservative on, on a number of issues, but he sa decided this is not a winning strategy. We're just going to focus on, um, you know, focus on the economy and see how it works. I am surprised that 35% of Canadians have noticed uh, Andrew Scheer to approve of him, quite frankly. Um, and I t really take uh, Sashi's point that in an election, everything changes. Um, I didn't think Stephen Harper was a plausible prime minister. I thought he doesn't like people enough. There's no way this guy's going to win. And I was totally wrong, of course. Um, but I still think that when we get to the next election, which is really the only time that this, these discussions matter, um, it, it, Trudeau is going to have to defeat himself, as, as all prime ministers in Canada seem to do. Um, it well may be that Scheer will find a new vigor and confidence uh, in the interim year uh, years. Uh, I don't know. Right now, he seems very weak to me. He seems, uh, when I say weak, I mean um, kind of unsure of himself, tentative. Um, I was really surprised after he won at how his French isn't really as good as I would have expected a former speaker's French to be. Um, he just doesn't seem to have any, um, he seems almost kind of deliberative. I don't know, he just doesn't seem leader-like yet well, to okay. me. That may change. Let me try this with Andrew. I mean, the fact is he's not 40 years old yet, so he's a young man. Uh, he's been the Speaker of Parliament. That's what they say, <clears throat> Steve. They say he's young. Yes, well, uh, <laughs> anyway, in fact... He doesn't look young to me, but anyway. Co compared to you and me, he is young. Um, the, the other fact is, I mean, as the, uh, as the Speaker, uh, you know, he... He hasn't had a lot of time in partisan politics over the last few years in the way that his colleagues in the Conservative caucus would have had. I want your take on, I think, one of the um, stronger decisions he's made over the last little while, and that was the decision to kick Lynn Bayak, the senator from Northwestern Ontario, uh, out of his caucus because of what he perceived as uh, you know, racist comments on the website about Indigenous people. Uh, he would say he acted strongly, firmly, and forcefully. What would you say? Um, I thought might be putting rather too uh, positive a spin on it. He took some time over it. He waited to see how the wind was blowing. He waited for her to add more fuel to the fire with publishing those letters online. Uh, I think he is trying to do a straddle between the populist elements within the party that, were, that Stephen Harper quite overtly tilted towards uh, and towards more mainstream voters so that he realizes the party had gotten out of touch with. So he's trying to... He's being very cautious, being very pragmatic about these things. Um, you know, he, he is uh, a, a low-key, kind of low-wattage, self-effacing kind of guy. Um, but it is, to take the point we made earlier, that may be, it may be good to fly below the radar for a while. And I certainly wouldn't be worried about his poll numbers at this point. You know, six months before the 1993 election, six months before the 2006 election, uh, Jean Chrétien and Stephen Harper were both facing intense criticism, I mean, in some cases calls for them to step down. Uh, so absolutely. And six months later they were, prime, they were minister. prime minister. So people don't pay attention and they certainly don't pay attention to opposition leaders until very close to the election. Okay, Alex, let me go to you on this because he's been described, Andrew Scheer has, as Stephen Harper with a smile. And you having written a book on Harper's political style, I wonder if you could tell us what you think the current leader of the Conservative Party has to learn from the former leader of the Conservative Party. 
I would say to be a little more ruthless. Um, the thing that was going through my mind while the others were speaking was that uh, the kind of thing that um, Mr. Shear and, and others around him may think about is really the strength uh, that can come and the positives that might come out of um, being very, very decisive, very firm, and kind of ruthless uh, the next time that somebody does anything in the area of the social conservative domain that risks damaging the conservative brand, its potential popularity with uh, sort of people who straddle the center of the Canadian political spectrum. Um, I think that some of the things they may think about doing is, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing I can imagine happening within the Stephen Harper uh, party, and, and there is an instance where they did have a, an internal memo. Uh, the suggestion I would have is pen an internal memo that says the next time that somebody does anything like this, uh, that person is instantly out of the party. There's very little conversation that's going to occur, and it's going to all happen uh, within a matter of hours. And what I would do is not only circulate that memo, but I would make sure that it becomes public. And so then that way what it does is it would frame everything and put pressure on the leader to then follow through on that, but it would really send a message within the party that, look, we are not going to be the party that tolerates anything that is going to damage the Conservative Party brand or the leader's brand in the area of uh, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Because I think that if there is a strength of the, the Liberal brand under Justin Trudeau, is that it's evolved from being a brand about federalism and national unity, and it has now become a brand of the Charter. And to me, that is a fundamental weakness of the Conservative Party. It has been for quite some time. It may continue to be. And I think that really Andrew Scheer and the Conservatives need to find some way to insulate themselves from criticism on those fronts. Quick final word, Andrew, on Andrew Scheer. That may be a shrewd strategy. I hope he doesn't do it, though. One of the complaints against Stephen Harper was that he ran a completely centrally commanded, top-down uh, government and party. Uh, and the minute you make that the, the, the role of the leader to, to police opinion within the party, then you're going to be responsible for everything, everything anybody says. We have to make room for the idea that elected officials, I'll make a, an exception for errant senators, but elected MPs have to be able to represent the strands of opinion that within, are within a party. They are responsible to do so sensibly and not, you know, not, Inflammatory. not saying stupid things, but there has to be room for debate and, and strands of opinion, not just within the Conservatives, but within every party. There has to be room on this program to look at Jagmeet Singh. He is the leader of the NDP. I guess we should start by congratulating him. He's just announced on Twitter that he's engaged to be married, so congratulations to him. Here are, according to the Angus Reid Institute, his numbers. 39% approve of the job he's doing, 33% disapprove, 28% don't know. Shachi, where is Jagmeet Singh doing well in this country at the moment? He's doing well in the cities, he's doing well with younger voters, and he's doing well with a base that he is going to have to compete with Justin Trudeau for. So, uh, you know, let's let's remember in the last election campaign, uh, we saw Tom Mulcair as sort of the, the, the elder statesman, uh, the, the prosecutorial uh, beard who, who was out to really give Stephen Harper a hard time. But then you've got a left of center vote in this country that is a mile wide, an inch deep, very much like oil on water, and it drifted and it moved and finally settled behind Justin Trudeau. That was the leader they liked. They liked the look of him. They liked the cut of his jib ultimately, and they liked what he was saying. Uh, certainly around issues of the economy, uh, the killer, as we remember for Tom Mulcair, was on saying that he would balance budgets. That was not what uh, voters wanted to hear last time around. This time, You've got Jagmeet Singh and Justin Trudeau potentially battling uh, for that same pool of voters. Jagmeet Singh has a play very much in the same way Andrew Scheer does to say that, uh, look, if we are making a decision in this coming election based on the promises that Justin Trudeau made in the last election on being the leader and being the government that would improve the livability of the middle class, has he fulfilled that promise? If not, then come back to your true left roots. Uh, don't abandon the NDP and come on back. Andrew Scheer's going to be making the same argument on the other side of the spectrum, saying, uh, we've seen what Justin Trudeau has done to the business community with small business tax changes. We've seen what he's done on debt and deficit. 
And uh, regardless of whether or not the employment numbers are good or bad, he has also, Trudeau, has not kept his promise on that promise to the middle class. That is the argument that both of them can make. They can try to squeeze against the middle. Uh, we'll see what happens. But right now, we're not really seeing very much of Jagmeet saying There is an argument that he should be in the House of Commons in order to at least get his five seconds of the day on, on the nightly news or on you know the Facebook news or where, whatever it is. Um, he's made the argument that he's better served these days by traveling and getting to know Canadians. Let's see how that's working for him over time. It didn't really show in the last four by-elections. Well, of course, they don't, they don't want to run him in a by-election that he has a chance of losing, so that's another reason why they don't want him, um, you know, taking that risk of getting him in the House there. But, Susan, I want to follow up with you. Jagmeet Singh is unlike any leader we've had in this country in 150 years. He is, never mind that he is a Sikh, he wears a turban. He is different, he looks different, and I wonder in particular... You live in Quebec, don't you? Yes, I do. Okay, so how do you think that plays in Quebec? I'm not sure it's as big a deal as people make make it out to be. Maybe in Quebec City, which is more uh, homogenous as a culture and and um, it tends more to be more conservative. But uh, throughout the province at large, I'm, I I mean I just don't know. I don't think anybody knows really what to make of this guy. I think in theory and because of a lot of things that Sashi said, um, he poses a greater risk to Justin Trudeau uh, than Andrew Scheer does, um, especially among young voters. Um, but he's um, He's, he remains a bit of a mystery, quite frankly. I think he would be well served uh, in the House, not just to get on the news, but to educate, to inform himself, uh, to come up with something that sounds like a very uh, strong and daring um, alternative to Justin Trudeau. Part of the reason that Justin Trudeau vaulted from third place to, to winning the last election was that he took a lot of risk. They took a lot of risks policy-wise. They, they did, as Andrew said, make great sweeping promises and commitments, but a lot of Canadians liked those promises and commitments. It didn't sound like the same old, same old. It didn't sound like the same old incrementalism, which has really been uh, the, the tone of uh, Canadian federal politics for as long as I've been uh, covering it. So, so there's a lot of potential there, but there's a lot unknown as well. Andrew, how do you view the religious attachments to Mr. Singh as it relates to his potential popularity in Quebec? Uh, I, I think these things are barriers until they aren't. Uh, people are oftentimes more liberal than they themselves know. They might have and they might tell pollsters that they have prejudicial views on this or that. And then when they're presented with a living, breathing example of that and the person doesn't scare them away, they change their views. It was unthinkable that there could be a Catholic president of the United States until John F. Kennedy ran and won. <laughs> So uh, that may or may not, we'll see. Uh, Quebec's a special case, perhaps, in the, in the rest of the country, but we'll see whether that. But I think he's got other obstacles. He's in trying to make the, the transition from provincial politics to federal, which, as we know, is always difficult in this country. Particularly, he was not particularly experienced even in provincial politics. Mm -hmm. I think some of that inexperience is shown, for example, in the Terry Molesky interview on the Air India bombing, where he couldn't answer a pretty simple, straightforward question or wouldn't answer. Um, he's made some other you know, misstatements and missteps. Uh, uh, so, I, I, the person who's most cheering him on, though, is Andrew Scheer, because the NDP has to do well for the Conservatives to have any chance. Justin Trudeau started that last election well back in third. He was able to expand his base by getting center-right voters who were agreed with Stephen Harper for other reasons than the economy, and because he was able to appeal to a lot of New Democrats. If, if both the Conservatives and the NDP can nibble away at them from the edges, then you know, he's still probably going to win, but he could be reduced, let's say, to a minority. Hmm. Alex, I've got a little over a minute to go here, and I want to ask you in particular about Jagmeet Singh because uh, he grew up in Newfoundland and Labrador, or at least spent part of his upbringing uh, in your province. What do you think folks there make of him? I would say most people haven't heard of him. Um, and ultimately, I would say that those who do see him, um, my, my instinct is that they would see that he's a very good speaker. And I would suggest that that's what they would end up focusing on. So initially they might realize, well, he, he maybe looks different than I do. Um, but then quickly they'd, they'd be potentially captivated by the way he speaks. I would say that the big issue for him and for the NDP is the following. Um, I would predict that in the final 48 hours of the next election campaign, uh, that the Liberals will come out and do what they've often done historically. And they'll say, do not vote NDP, because if you do, you're voting for the Conservatives and you'll end up with a Conservative government. So how does the NDP position itself to be prepared for that potential eventuality? Uh, that really sums it up very nicely. I want to thank all of you for coming on to our program tonight, helping us understand 
uh, where things are at in federal politics these days. Shachi Curl is the executive director of the Angus Reid Institute. We thank you uh, for being there for us in Vancouver, British Columbia. Alex Marlin, political scientist from Memorial University, the author of Brand Command, Canadian Politics and Democracy in the Age of Message Control. Congrats, incidentally, on winning the Donner Prize last year for that work. Sure. Alex has been with us from St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, of course. Susan Riley, the freelance columnist in the nation's capital. Andrew Coyne, who I always read in the National Post. Despite, despite my personal antipathy towards you, I always enjoy reading you in the National Post. I'm kidding, of course. Uh, we thank all four of you for coming on TVO tonight. So long, everybody. Thanks, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.